But first of all, hello Barcelona. Thank you very much for being here. I know that I'm in between you and lunch. Uh, and I'm pretty sure you are pretty much talked out, so I'll, I'll make it good. Okay, we've all heard of fear of missing out, or FOMO, right? Here's the thing, about um, a few years ago, when I started working with containers and Kubernetes, when we're talking about containers, we really meant Docker, um, and it worked, and it was simple to use, and we didn't have to worry at all about what was happening from, at a low level. Then a couple of years ago, I've started hearing all of this new terminology, like CRI, the Container Runtime Interface, or OCI, the Open Container Initiative, and Container D, and Run C, and, and other types of terminologies. And that's when a massive fear of missing out overcame me. I didn't want to be left behind. But I didn't have time to think about it. So fast forward to November 2018, when I get an email from Google Cloud telling me, hey, now you can run your GKE clusters on, uh, using the Container D runtime. And that was the moment when I decided I really need to play with this. So what better way of doing that than migrating your workloads from a Kubernetes cluster running on Docker engine to a Kubernetes cluster running on Container D. So for the last, well, Docker brought containers to mainstream. And um, it was working great. Um, and then, and this is what, everyone's using Docker, and that's what we've been using for the last five years. So this brings me to today, and I'm gonna talk to you about what is a container runtime, because the whole landscape is very, very confusing. In fact, um, Ian, I used a lot of your um, resources. They're very, very useful. And then I'm gonna talk about the different container runtimes and making sense of, of them. Then um, about the uh, container D, and migrating to Container D, and as a user uh, who administers Kubernetes clusters, why should you care? But before we do that, I'm pretty sure you're all dying to know me. I mean, I'm already been introduced, so this isn't working anymore, but let me introduce myself again. So I'm Anna Kalin, I'm a systems engineer, I work on infrastructure, site reliability, and securing applications. I work for Paybase, which and uh, the most flexible API-driven solution for, uh, uh, for compliance, risk, and payment. And uh, you can find me on social media. We're gonna cover the definition of a container runtime. We're gonna cover the type of container runtimes, um, a quick comparison between Docker, Container D, and Cryo, um, an architectural overview, migration, uh, and user performance. So what is a container runtime? According to a definition I found, a container runtime is responsible for all the parts of running a container that isn't actually running the program itself. Now, please raise your hand if you understand what the container runtime is based on this definition. Okay, so okay, you're doing better than me. When I first read this, I didn't quite understand it, so I did my own research. So the way I used to think about containers at the very beginning, and the way you might think about containers as well, is um, a bit similar to how uh, we used to think of in the VM world. So you have the kernel, then you have another layer, which is the runtime, and then you have another layer, which is the container itself exactly like the, in the VMware uh, world. Now, this is wrong, uh, because a container is really an isolated process on the kernel. What gives us, uh, and more realistically, based on that, the way it would look like is, you have the kernel, then, so you have a client that talks to a runtime that tells the kernel okay, give me all of these processes that I need to create in order to um, run containers. 
and the kernel creates those, pro uh, those processes that we call containers. So the process as isolation um, that we, we need for containers is given by uh, a few features in the Linux kernel. And I wanted to very quickly recap for those of you that might not be familiar. So first of all, we have the concept of a namespace, not a Kubernetes namespace, a Linux kernel namespace. And what that does is um, it partitions um, different kernel resources into, in, in a way in which uh, the resources in the same namespace see, see the same things, that they're isolated from each other at the namespace level. And then we have uh, three different um, namespaces that are relevant here. We have the PID, which is um, the, proce uh, the process ID namespace that gives us the numbering of processes in such a way that at the namespace level, you, um, you, you can use, in different namespaces, you can use the same uh, PID without being aware of each other, without interacting with each other. Then, we have the networking namespace. And what did this does is um, it, um, it makes sure that the ports that you're using in containers are separate, um, don't interfere with the ports that are already open on the kernel itself. Then we have the mount namespace, and uh, that allows us to mount and unmount file systems um, on containers without conflicting with the host file system. And then we're talking about C groups or control, control groups, and they allow us, um, uh, they give us resource uh, limitations. So um, when we give um, CPU limitations and memory uh, limitations in Kubernetes, that translates down to a runtime level. And then the last one is SecComp BPF. I hope I said that correctly. But what this does is um, it allows us to filter what kind of system calls certain processes can and cannot do. So that's a, a security feature. So I like this picture, and I think that you could say that this might be a good analogy of how runtimes and the kernel and containers sort of are. So um, my highlight, uh, oh, okay, it works. So if we imagine that this is the kernel, and then the, you know, the runtime gives commands to the kernel, and then each one of these, it's a namespace that runs the containers and their functionalities. That's the best way I would picture this. So let's look at the different types of container runtimes. So, we have low-level runtimes and we have high-level runtimes. And then we have Docker, which, is, which does low-level, high-level, and additional functionality. When we say low-level runtimes, we mean LXC, RunC, and LMCTFY. And I'm not gonna go into these, but all you need to know about them um, in this context is that they are the, um, the runtimes that take care of creating those namespaces and that process isolation at the kernel point of view. Then we have the high-level runtimes like Cryo and ContainerD, and there are a few others. Now, the reason why we have high-level as well is because just creating namespaces and isolating processes, that's not enough to run a container. You need API, APIs, you need additional functionality, you need the ability to pull and push images and unpack them and then pass them all to the low level runtime. So um, when I'm saying we're gonna talk about container D and I'm gonna migrate to a container D runtime, what I'm really saying is yes, container D, um, I'm gonna use container D, but container D cannot work on its own without a low level runtime. Okay, so a better definition of how I understand container runtimes in a very simplified way is a container runtime is responsible for setting up namespaces and C groups 
and then running command inside those namespaces plus additional things. Um, and I feel like this is a really good time to add a bit more uh, terminology so that we can use it. So the CRI, the Container Runtime Interface, is a plugin interface which enables the kubelet to use a wide variety of container runtimes without the need to recompile. The OCI is the Open Container Initiative, which is a Linux Foundation project that allows us to design open source standards for operating system level virtualizations and for Linux containers. And then we have the CRIO, which is a container runtime that I'll tell you about in a bit. So let's do a comparison. Okay, so this is the full feature set of Docker Engine. And um, as you can see, it does a lot of things. Um, now, Docker was the first open source container runtime, if you want to call it that way, uh, that um, was taking care of the whole life cycle of building containers, uh, building images, them, pushing them, pulling them, then containing, uh, then creating run uh, containers out of them, and so on. So it was taking care of the whole life cycle of containers. But then some time ago, I'm not a historian, so I don't know the exact time, but some time ago, Docker decided to split its monolith daemon functionality into different um, features, different components, and it looks a bit like this. So you have the Docker CLI, then you have the Docker D, which is the piece of functionality that does all of the additional functionality um, in terms of building images and packaging them and stuff like that. Then you have Docker Container D, which is a vanilla version of, uh, created by Docker of Container D that we'll talk about in a second. And then Docker Run C, which is the low level uh, that creates those namespaces we talked about. Okay, so in a Kubernetes cluster, when, when we want to run Kubernetes, we really need this bit, right? So we need the low-level functionality and we need the high-level functionality and the rest will talk to Kubernetes. Now, when I first saw this and was thinking about this, my first thought was, wait, so you're telling me that I don't need networking to run in a Kubernetes cluster, or I don't need uh, persistent storage? You do, but that's something that Kubernetes give, gives you. So you have the, the services resources that Kubernetes uses to take care of networking. You have the storage classes and the persistent volumes that you use uh, for persistent storage. So purely from a Kubernetes point of view, you don't need all of the additional functionality of Docker. And it's really not fair to compare Docker to Container D because, because Docker has Container D and um, relies on it. So it's more of a um, more or less features. In terms of how it looks in terms of um, interaction with Kubernetes, uh, Docker versus Container D, so the kubelet talks to the Docker shim, which is the CRI um, implementation uh, for Docker. And the Docker shim talks to the Docker server that um, takes care of building images and so on. And Docker um, server ha hands over commands to container D, and uh, container D then talks to run C and then, then creates containers. Now, in the container D world, it's slightly more simplified. You still have the kubelet, and um, that talks with the component called CRI uh, Container D, which uh, takes CRI requests from Kubernetes and kubelet, um, and then it directly talk, talks to Container D. So there's one feature removed from the Container D flow. Now, I think it's worth comparing really fast Container D version 1 versus version 1.2 because um, 
in version 1.2, uh, they took the CRI container, this feature, and they made it to, into a plugin, which meant that you, you had a, a lot of user, a better user performance, a better uh, pod latency startup and things like that. So in terms of limitations between container D and Docker, um, Docker engine, if we, we are to take it feature by feature, it sort of looks like container D is losing, right? Well, it's not because it's meant to be more lightweight. And because from a Kubernetes point of view, you still get to do all of the same things that you don't really use um, in a Kubernetes cluster when you, when you use Docker. And then there's um, another limitation, more like could potentially be a security flaw with Docker engine. The fact that if an attacker uh, gets into a Kubernetes cluster, into a node, and uh, having Docker engine, then they, they can build images locally into the node, and then they can deploy it into your cluster. But if you have just energy, you don't have that ability. Okay, so Cryo is um, a lightweight CRI runtime that was uh, made specifically for Kubernetes as a high-level runtime. It supports the management of OCI-compatible images, and it supports also RunC as a low-level and clear containers. And in theory, it supports other OCI-compatible uh, low-level runtimes. I say in theory because um, when supporting other low-level runtimes, it still depends on some of the features of RunC. Let's quickly have a look at the container D architecture. So it's a bit crowded, but we need all of these features, and they're all very good. So at the top here, you can see all of the clients uh, that can be used with or by container D. So we have the kubelet, we have Pouch implemented container D, Docker is using it. You have the Do Docker container D client and the container D CLI um, that lets you interact directly with container D runtime. Then we have the, the gRPC container D API that allows you to directly communicate uh, with the um, with container D without using the client if you want to, or for applications to communicate with it. Then um, there's a met metrics API, um, and the kind of metrics that are exposed are container D process uh, specific metrics, as well as container specific metrics, which um, are really useful for Prometheus. And a really, really neat, neat feature is the runtime manager or the runtime handler that in version 1.2 will let you switch from run C to any, uh, to low level runtimes. Okay. So now let's get serious. Let's talk about what it takes to migrate. It's actually quite easy. De uh, depends on your setup. So, AWS EKS doesn't currently support container D as a runtime. Azure AKS uses Mobi, which is, um, which is a version of like a flavor of Docker, and it uses that to, as a container runtime. And um, with e AKS, a customer can deploy their own Kubernetes clusters with a different runtime using the AKS engine. And then there's GKE. And um, they support it. And the way you'd go about creating a cluster um, with container D runtime, it'd be just a matter of uh, selecting the COS container D image or your, uh, of your cluster, or just creating a new node pool in an existing cluster and then uh, migrating the workloads. Now, one thing that I want to be clear on this, um, initially, before I started looking into any of this, I was a bit worried of the kind of effort it would take to migrate because 
without knowing much about anything, I thought, oh, well, all of my images were built with Docker. Does that mean that I have to recreate all of my images? I hope it's clear now that no, you don't, because, um, because container D is part of Docker and all of that. So image, the images that you already have are completely compatible with container D as well. So steps to migrate con uh, to container D on GKE. So you'd first create a node pool into your cluster using cost container D. Then you'd cordon those old node pools using that uh, command there, um, and you'll have access to the slides later. Then you'd drain the existing pods and wait for them to be recreating, recreated on your new node pools that are running container D. So it's, it's quite straightforward. In terms of user observation and why should you care or, or shouldn't you care, um, I tried to picture this as a user from my different responsibilities and my different roles. So as an SRE with uh, service level agreements on my mind, I really care about being able to troubleshoot fast. And what I get with Container D is the Cry CTL, uh, which is um, the client that allows me to talk directly to the Cry implementation. And it allows me to troubleshoot containers and pods or nodes in my cluster in the event of an emergency. Then there's CTR, which is the uh, client Container D tool that allows me to create and manage containers and install plugins and uh, switch between low-level runtimes. In terms of performance, I am a systems engineer, and I do have to deploy new features, usually yesterday. And because of that, I really care about performance. So Container D performs better in terms of pod startup latency compared to Docker engine version 18. Uh, there's about 20 seconds latency that Container D, um, uh, Container D is 20 seconds faster than uh, Docker. And um, this is something that I haven't created, so I wanted to make sure that that's the case, so I sort of did my own test. So I spun up two different clusters, GKE clusters, one running Docker engine, one running Container D on the exact same version of GKE. Um, and then I've installed with Helm the NGINX ingress stable Helm chart. And I took one of the pods um, and I looked at how long it took between uh, the pod being initialized and the pod being marked as ready. So you can see that this is on the Docker runtime, and you can see here the timestamp. Um, um, the time it was initialized, and then you can see the time it started. And oh, and yeah, it's about 20 minutes in between. On Container D, doing the same thing with the same chart, uh, picking the exact same pod. Um, you can see that the, the time it was initialized, um, uh, the time that passed between when it was initialized and when the pod was marked as ready, um, it's exactly two seconds. Now, I know that, that that won't be the case for all of the pods, but in general, it seems that Container D, in terms of pod startup latency, performs better. From a performance point of view, as an infrastructure engineer, I care about resource optimization um, and resource utilization. And um, here we're talking about usage. And, um, and the Kubelet CPU um, with Container D um, has 30.89% uh, uses 30.89% CPU and um, the runtime CPU is about 
more expense, a more effective we contain at D. And there are very similar metrics in terms of memory usage. From a security point of view, well, I'm also an engineer with PCI DSS compliance on my mind. And if you don't know what PCI DSS is, you're very, very lucky because it's a very horrible standard that uh, payment institutions have to comply with. And it talks about a lot of security and a lot of really ridiculous requirements. So from that point of view, ContainerD has a smaller attack surface than Docker simply because it has less, less features. Uh, when ContainerD graduated from CNCF, they published their full uh, security audit. And it looks quite good. And in the event that um, my auditor comes to me and says, oh, can you prove to me that your container runtime is uh, secure enough? I know that that's not going to happen, but I can say, yes, I can. Here's the security audit. And um, what I mentioned before with Docker, an attacker with access to my nodes can build images locally and uh, install them into my cluster. So that brings me to summary. Um, my conclusion is that Docker scope is too large for what you need in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, container D between Docker and CRI, uh, O, container D is more, more flexible and much more lighter than Docker. Um, and that's a good advantage. And uh, container D runs on top of low level runtimes such as Run C, and you can plug them in and out. And it performs better and it's more secure than Docker. It's fairly easy to migrate. And in case you're wondering to what step we are with our migration, we're not yet in production because I'm still testing. Um, and yeah, that's my summary. Uh, I have added some resources if anyone is interested in reading more about the subject. And I'd like to leave you with the fact that we're hiring, so if any of these things that I've been talking about sound interesting to you, please come and talk to me or email or launch party in August last year. And thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Uh, we have a good amount of time left for, uh, for questions, if you have any questions. Um, okay. If you want to like, actually come up to the front, like, that would be actually really helpful. And uh, I'll just give you the mic, and we can kind of go from there. How's that working? Yeah. Yeah, just maybe like, kind of line up here is, if that works out. I'm going to take you first, if you don't mind. Hi, thanks. Hello. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about what you might miss out on uh, by moving away from Docker to uh, a thinner container runtime. That was in my talk. I completely forgot to mention it. Uh, so don't miss on anything from a, from a Kubernetes point of view, from a, a cluster point of view. Um, you would still use Docker locally to build your images and play around and you know all of that really nice functionality that you do when testing locally. But from a Kubernetes point of view, you're not missing on anything. Um, you, just, you just have less features that you don't normally use. Uh, I don't know about you, but I never really log into my Kubernetes nodes and uh, start playing with Docker. In fact, we have SSH disabled in our cluster, so that just doesn't happen. Um, but yeah, does that respond to your question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, we build a managed Kubernetes offering, and we actually don't let our users SSH in anyway. So that's what I was wondering whether there was anything yes, yeah. else you missed out. Great, thanks. Cool. Nice talk, thanks. Uh, any insights into where the performance differences come from? Uh, so um, one of them is in version 1.1, they they made that container the cry container D feature into a plugin, so that reduced the latency. Between, uh, between the different components. Um, and then the fact that Docker has that additional feature, the, the Docker server uh, component. So it's like a, a bigger chain of elements that it goes through. Um, that's one of them. Um, in terms of how it was 
how it was measured. It was, it was an average over 105 pods in a, in a cluster in a, in a stable state. And that's 105 is, I think, is the maximum you can have in a, in a cluster. Does that respond to your question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Junaid Ali, uh, and uh, thank you for the great talk and uh, introducing me with uh, ContainerD. Um, uh, I have a question. So uh, as you mentioned that we cannot uh, build uh, container images with ContainerD, right? Yeah. Uh, so it means that we cannot use any CI uh, that uh, depends on uh, uh, building and pushing images. For example, with Docker, uh, and usually in enterprises, they have CI, and uh, they use Docker in Docker, or uh, they just um, uh, mount the Docker proxy, uh, Docker Docker socket, uh, with limited access uh, for uh, for their CI environment. So it is not possible with ContainerD, right? Or um, are, are there any workarounds? I mean, it is it's not possible with ContainerD, but we actually have the same the same sort of implementation. We we run all of our images through CI before that get pushed into a, a Google repository. And there, we still use Docker. But in the actual Kubernetes cluster, so we don't, don't run the CI functionality within the Kubernetes cluster. That would, would probably impact our application, more, more, more centrally impact our application. So, um, so we still have Docker in our um, you know, CI process. Hey, uh, great talk, thank you. Um, just curious if you've run any performance tests with Cryo or if you plan to. Um, no, I, ha I haven't looked at all. Um, all I, I've, I've done very little research in Cryo, and it was more about how it compares, and it just seems that it's less flexible and a bit more lightweight than ContainerD. But apart from that, I can't tell you much. Okay. And have you looked at any other build tools like Builda or anything instead, and just get away from Docker altogether? Um, it was a personal project that I started, so um, by the time I got there, um, RKT is no longer supported as far as I know. Uh, I'm sorry, say again? RKT is no longer supported. No, I, I was talking about Builda, just to make OCI images instead of Docker images. All right. Um, no, I haven't. I haven't looked into other, yeah. Oh, thank you. Hi, nice talk. Uh, I don't know if you have come across the situation when you have your application team in Kubernetes where they use Docker and Docker. So if you migrate to ContainerD, how do you handle the situation of Docker and Docker? Um, no, I haven't come across this situation. How, how does that work? Why would you use Docker and Docker? Uh, for various application needs, uh, this is our application teams who, who need it for their applications to be running on the cluster. They need to, to mount Docker and Docker on the Docker sock. Currently, when we run Docker, they just mount it on Docker. And I now, see. Yeah. So how um, would that work? Then? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, okay. if, if you stay around, maybe we can discuss so I can understand better. But uh, yeah, I, no, I'm not sure. No worries. Thanks. Does so anybody else have any questions? OK, great. Uh, thank you very much, Anna. Thank you.